as many opportunities to read, listen, watch, you know, any type of way to absorb information. That's how I tend to learn is I just throw as much as I can at it and something will stick. Um, so I'm really excited with the information y'all are sharing. My name is Jenna Golden. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I come to the world of taxes and accounting in general, actually through a focus on women's studies and psychology. That's what my background is. And that's what I was actually trying to go to school for when some things in my life ended up resulting in me kind of changing gears and getting a little bit of part-time work, helping a friend keep track of their income and expenses for their business, just because I was pretty uh, organized. And then one thing led to another, I ended up getting into the world of tax because I saw a big void there in terms of um, tax preparers that have like a social justice lens and focus. Um, and so that's really what I try to bring to the work that I do. It's really focused on relational, um, focus, on the, focus on the relationship with the client, focus on thinking about the context in which we live and how tax impacts that. Um, and I really just want to make this as comfortable for you as possible because I realize that it is incredibly uncomfortable to talk about money and to talk about tax. Um, and I'm really excited for you all to be here. And I'm really excited that you're reserving this time of your day to do this work because it's incredibly empowering. So I'm going to start getting ready. And like Tara said, feel free to put questions in the chat. I'm going to, after pretty much every slide, I'm going to check in and see if anyone has questions. If you want to speak to me, great. If you want to write it in the chat, great. And I'm pretty good about um, keeping up with the chat throughout. Um, if I can't get to your question today, I will acknowledge it and also try to check in with you um, afterwards. And if I don't know the answer to your question, I'll offer to do research. So let's see, getting the gallery going. I love it when you have your camera on only because then I don't talk to myself. <laughs> so thank you for those of you who have, but no pressure for those of you who have, and I totally understand. Um, okay, so let me get the present my screen. I actually haven't taught in a minute, so this is exciting. Okay, here we go. And I guess I didn't say my business is called Shift Accounting. And let me get the chat going. I got to get all my screens ready. Here we go. I can see y'all in the chat. Great. Okay, here we go. So I also like to just start talking about tax and accounting and name the assumptions that I'm coming to when I do this work. And I think that um, there is this tax lawyer, Dorothy E. Brown, that just wrote this book called I believe it's the wealth of whiteness or the whiteness of wealth. I forget which one comes first, but really Dorothy focuses on how contextualized tax is. And she came to tax as like a black woman who was like, I don't want to do something involved with race. I want to talk about tax because tax, you know, they don't ask for your race when they do your tax return. And of course she realized right away, of course it has everything to do with all of our identities when we prepare our taxes. It tells a huge story about our lives, our history, our futures. And so I feel like it's really important to always talk about where we're coming from when we're doing this work. Um, and I'd really like my industry to shift in that direction for sure. So um, I was inspired to do this by Hadassah Damian, who's a wonderful reference, so many free resources um, that you can find. And on my website, there's all the people I talk about today, you can find how to access them. Um, so coming into today's workshop, I'm operating from the assumptions and values listed below that everyone deserves to have resources, that capitalism is an unjust economic system, and that the tax code upholds it, and that there's no perfect way to run your business. The idea of perfectionism is a value of white supremacy, and it's meant to make people feel that they're not doing it right. And so already people have mentioned, you know, like, I feel like I haven't been trained. I'm not sure. I don't understand if I'm doing it right. And like, that is set up by design to make you already feel that you're doing it wrong and that there is one way to do it also. And so I think that it's really important to name that um, and to just kind of be really proud of yourselves because choosing to try and be a business owner, to have a side hustle, to have a gig that you do yourself um, means you're writing your own financial story instead of having it written for you. And I think we've seen so clearly, I mean, many folks have seen this for for forever, but in the last year and a half, that what one once thought was stable income and a stable job really isn't. And so I think I'm seeing so many more people delve into this self-employment world um, to have really more control. So here we go. So kind of the first conversation is, what is self-employment versus an employee? 
like getting down to that point about what is the difference when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about it on a very base level. Um, it's about the relationship. So when you're an employee, each time that you're paid, there are taxes taken out or withheld is like the language that's often used from your paycheck. Um, what's happening when that happens is that your employer withholds that money for you and then sends it to the proper, you know, departments, the IRS, Oregon, et cetera, on your behalf throughout the year, quarterly actually. And that kind of relates to this idea of estimated tax payments. Some of you might've heard of, but in essence, every time you're paid taxes are taken out and then they're paid on your behalf. Um, so it's just something to remember about what's a part of what defines an employee, as well as the fact that your employer directs and controls when, where, and how you work. Um, when you're self-employed or freelance, independent contractor, small business owner, so many of these words are interchangeable, um, and you receive payment for your services or sale of goods, no taxes are taken out from your income. So you would take essentially the, if it's a service-based thing, it would be your hours times your wage, your, um, your pay rate, and you would get that exact amount in payment, no taxes taken out. Um, also, you have control over when, where, and how you work. That's your decision. Um, does anyone want to ask any questions about that in the chat or anything? No? Okay. Let me get this bigger so I can see everybody who's on the camera. Um, okay. So this is a slide where I introduce structure. Structure could be hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of conversation, but at base level, it actually is pretty simple and I kind of just want to demystify it here. So what I'm going to do is share some basics about Oregon and how Oregon treats business structure, because you have to understand that every state is going to be a little different in what they charge and how they want you to go about signing up, essentially registering. Um, the next slide is actually going to show you all the steps that I'm going to explain now. So, and you're going to get access to this entire slideshow. So don't feel like you have to like write these notes and it's going to go away. I will get it to you, I promise. So if you want to just watch and listen and take some notes, wonderful. Um, so at base level, any one person under their name and their tax ID, which could be your social security number or your ITIN, your just taxpayer identification number, if I'm selling my time or selling a good in exchange for money, I'm a sole proprietor. That's it. That's all that's required. Um, there's a little thing with the city of Portland that they want you to do, and I'll mention that, but basically it doesn't cost anything to be a sole proprietor. If you're using your name and your tax ID, you don't have to register with the secretary of state. You're doing business, that's it, according to the IRS. Um, most folks that I work with will use their social security number at that point or their ITIN to identify themselves. You don't have to go get an, a separate EIN, which stands for employer identification number. You don't have to go ahead and do that at that point. I would say keep it simple, start simple. Um, the sole proprietor DBA um, or ABN, so DBA just stands for doing business as, ABN is assumed business name. So really what's that saying is you wanna do business under a name that's not yours, right? So you wanna have a name for your business that is not your personal name and you wanna do business under that name, get paid under that name, advertise under that name. In Oregon, that's $50 every other year. So you register with the secretary of state with the name, you wanna do a name search and make sure it's not already taken, right? Again, I have that on the next slide. Um, you can register there, you renew it every other year. And usually as long as you have your address updated, you'll get a letter in the mail or some notification it's time to pay the fee. Um, they're very easy to talk to on the phone as well if you have questions, the secretary of state's pretty easy to access. Um, and again, you can still use your social security number or you can also get an EIN number. If you're gonna ever have employees, you will have to get an EIN, but most times at this level, it's, it, we're not there yet, right? So that's a whole other host of complication and things to talk about that we actually can't talk about right now. And we really wanna bring in a payroll professional to have that conversation. But for now, it's pretty simple. The next level would be the single member LLC. And I say level, it's really about the cost going up. None of the, these actually all pay taxes exactly the same way. The sole proprietor, the sole proprietor DBA, and the single member LLC file the exact same tax form. And we'll see that later on. The form is called the Schedule C. And it is the form that goes on your personal tax return every year, which is the Form 1040. So all of them are exactly the same tax wise. The differences come in liability, which I'm going to now say, and cost pretty much. 
Um, single member LLC, the LLC stands for limited liability company, which is a legal designation, actually not a tax one. Um, it's $100 a year in Oregon in other states and California is our neighbor in California, it's $800 a year. So the advice that I would give a client in Oregon is not going to be the same advice in California. So just be mindful if you're moving, right, or you talk to someone else in another state, they might not know how Oregon behaves. So it's always great to find the Secretary of State in the state you're in and talk to them. Um, at this level, I would recommend getting an employer identification number for sure. It's free with the IRS. So you, you would essentially register with the Oregon Secretary of State with your name. You would get the acceptance. Then you would go to the IRS website and for free, and all of it's on the second slide I'm going to show you. Um, you would go to the IRS website, get your employer identification number, which happens pretty much instantly. You would take both those pieces of information and then you would go to the bank. And the reason why you would need to go to the bank and set it up with the bank is that you need to be able to identify yourself with that new tax ID and the name, right? So if someone writes you a check to a name that isn't yours, how do you cash it? We need to have a bank that acknowledges that that entity exists. So for the DBA, for the LLC, we need to have a bank to acknowledge that, that that's an existence. The city of Portland is also part of this process. Um, I don't consider it to be incredibly important, even though they really want us to push it. And it's a website that you would just register that you exist as a business if you live in the zip codes that um, they require. And I have the website for that as well. And I'll talk about the city of Portland Multnomah County business tax and the cost of it um, later on. The other two entities are um, outside of what we can really talk about today because of the complexity and because you really at that point need to be talking to, um, I would say a tax professional. So the S Corporation LLC, for clients of mine that have been in business for quite some time, they have bookkeeping records, they are in practice of having money in and money out and keeping business and personal separate. At the level that they're making around $50,000 after expenses, right? So not total income earned, but income after expenses, that's when I start having those conversations with people of the 300 clients I have, maybe 50 of them are in these zones. So it's not super prevalent with the size of businesses I'm working with and the clientele that I have, which are working people. So I would say, not, I wouldn't be concerned about it off the bat. If you are going to generate the type of income that you might want to talk about it, then you're in the position where you could probably hire a professional to consult with and it's worth it. Like I know people, it's easy to justify advertising and things to get the business rolling, but having these conversations on the front end and potentially paying someone to consult with could be a really good idea when you're involving the corporate level or you're gonna have a business partner. I saw someone mention like maybe they wanted to start a business with a friend or something. Um, I, my business is uh, a two persons S corporation LLC. I would say if you're going to do a partnership, um, it's co complicated, relationships are complicated. It requires um, an operating agreement on the front end to really talk about what happens if it doesn't go right. What happens if someone gets sick? What happens if you wanna break up? Like it's all the conversations. And so I think that I mostly encourage people to start on their own and then maybe come together later. It's not to say it won't work, you know, and it's not to say you won't learn something if it doesn't, but I just feel like a lot of people want to jump in together. And unless you do the steps to help you be successful on the front end and on the back end, it could be harder than it needs to be is really what I'm saying. Right. So get a taste of what it's like to be self employed and then maybe join forces. Um, and again, it's $100 a year for the LLC and $50 every other year for the DBA. Um, someone mentioned what was the cutoff amount. I'm not sure if that means for the S corporation. I was just saying S corporation, uh, what I suggest to people, and that's also factoring in my rate, which is not industry standard. So if you're going to go to industry standard, which is a bit higher than what I charge, um, colleagues of mine would have you say you're making around $75,000 after expenses, which is your net income. We'll talk about that more. I say closer to 50 and holding and growing. Um, then that's again, after expenses. Um, and that I say that because that's when you start to maybe save some money because there's costs to being S corporation LLC that are different than a single member LLC or a sole proprietor DBA or a sole proprietor. There's significant costs. And so you have to make sure that those costs are outweighed by the benefits. And these change constantly because tax law changes. And I would have had a much lower threshold before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. 
And then since that changed, now the way I, I talk to my clients has changed. Um, so again, this could get in the weeds because you're like, what is this? I wanna know about it. It's the thing we're not talking about. I would say not necessary when you're starting off, it's a thing you grow into. And it's a thing that makes sense over time as you, it's not like you don't pay taxes as you get to these levels at all. It just means there's a potential to have some savings. Um, any other questions about this right now? And if you have something that comes up later, you can always come back to it. Um, so this is the steps I've been talking about about registering. Step one would be to choose a structure. It could be as simple as saying, I'm a sole proprietor, I'm using my tax ID and name, and that's all. Um, and if you are a sole proprietor, I tell you to skip to step four, which is go to the city of Portland website and register your business. Um, and then you would go to the bank. The, uh, the rest of them, you will just follow these steps and the links are all active. So you will have access to this and it's step-by-step step what you're supposed to do. If you've already done things and you miss steps, there's ways to fix it. You could always call the secretary of state and explain your situation and they'll give you guidance on how to get where you wanna be. So if you start as a DBA and you wanna become an LLC, there's a way to do that that's efficient and actually cost uh, more cost-effective when you talk to the secretary of state, they will tell you how they want the information. It's much easier than dealing with the IRS. It's really hard to get the IRS on the phone. So I won't suggest you call them unless you really have to. Um, let's see, would paying yourself a salary count as expenses? That's only for S corporations. It's only for corporations in general. If a corporation has the ability, an owner, to pay themselves a salary as an expense, sole proprietor, DBA, single member LLC and partnership, it's not the same. So it, it, again, and payroll is very complicated. So that's why it's something that people grow into. Um, after income, let's see. I'm going to read this out loud. The first year, I probably will have a $10,000 loss. Um, no, that totally makes sense. Um, having a loss the first year is totally fine. Having a loss multiple years happens. And there's times that, especially artists, fine artists, oftentimes will have losses for many years and then have a big windfall, right? Because they have a big show they're preparing for and then maybe losses again. It's all about are you trying to have a, 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 a the word successful is problematic and because I just realized that I'm saying it and it's embedded in this idea of what success is, which is like a capitalist kind of vision of it, which isn't my vision. My vision is that if you are trying to make the business something dependable for your income, whatever that may be, if you are advertising, if you are registering a name, if you have a website, et cetera, et cetera, just because you're not profiting doesn't mean that's an automatic audit. I've also been doing taxes for over 10 years and thousands of small business returns and knock on wood, none of my clients have ever been audited. I don't know that that means that there's something about me. I just think that it's not as frequent as we feel like it is because it's also a system based on fear. So the idea that we're too scared to claim expenses, we're too scared to do a thing to advocate for ourselves and get in a better position, we don't get as many expenses, which means we pay more in taxes. Whereas someone who has a lot more access to resources and wealth can pay people to navigate the system for them, right? So I'm going to tell you at the level we're at of starting a business, no assumptions of what access y'all have. It's our job to advocate for ourselves. It's our job to push that kind of bill. Um, but I think it's totally fine to have a loss the first year. I have clients that have them many years down the road and sometimes, and sometimes I'll talk to them about it and say, it's been a while, you know. I just want to name that. That doesn't mean that anything's going to happen because of it. And it doesn't mean if you get audited that you're wrong because that just happens sometimes. I'm going to keep going, keep throwing questions at me. Um, taxes are a pay as you earn system. So I, I recognized this before. According to the IRS, when you get payment for services as a self employed person or employee, you're supposed to pay taxes in real time. And like I said, your employer does that for you. But what about when you don't have an employer? What happens when you're your own employer, in essence? Um, so what taxes do you pay? How do you pay them? When do you pay them? So I'm going to kind of talk about those things today. Um, these are a list of the taxes that you may be responsible for as a self-employed person who has profit. So Rose mentioned having a loss. If your business is in the red, negative number, you're not going to owe on your business income, right? But if you do show a profit, there are taxes that will show up. The most common ones are federal income tax, state income tax, social security tax, and Medicare tax. Those are pretty much a given, and those everyone's paying on their wages as well. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that a little more too. TriMet tax is a local tax. 
Um, and then you can look up your zip code if you're not sure if you're in the TriMet district. Um, but it's a, it's a, I'm going to explain it later. It's a tax on your business's profit. It's pretty small tax, but it is something to consider the city of Portland, Multnomah County tax. I'll talk about more later. Um, payroll tax. If you have employees, absolutely. In my mind, a guesstimate is that payroll taxes cost about 10% of your employees wages. So if you have an employee and you pay them $30,000 a year, they will cost you that 30. They will cost you an additional 10% or $3,000 in taxes. And then of course, other costs might come in insurance and things like that. But just so you have a gauge for people when they talk about payroll taxes, that's what they're talking about. You as an employee cost more to your employer because of the payroll taxes they pay on your behalf. Um, personal property taxes. I just added this in, to be honest, I don't ever deal with personal property taxes. I have like very few clients that have enough that would require them to do it. It's it, in the in this county. It's about seventeen thousand dollars worth of like assets, equipment, things like that, improvements. Most of my clients don't have that, so I never really deal with it. I've never filed a personal property tax form for my business. We don't really have any assets. We have a computer, um, you know. So I only put this in because I felt like I was being a bad tax preparer because I didn't mention it. And some of my colleagues are like obsessed with personal property taxes, so I just wanted to be um, do my due diligence. I have a slide about it and where to go to find out about it. If you've never done it, don't worry about it. I never did it. I'm a tax preparer. I've been doing this for years. I've never filed one for my business. I do have clients that have restaurants that have. So, and it's not a very high tax. It's based on how much stuff you own, big stuff really. Um, but it's just something to be mindful of. So taxes for the self-employed are more. So I mentioned social security and Medicare tax. So this is all like tying into that conversation about being an employee versus being self-employed and um, who pays what. And so one, one thing to be mindful of is that the taxes are actually a bit more. And so I use this example, it's just a flat number of $10,000. So say you're an employee of someone and you make $10,000 in the year. Um, seven and a half percent of your wages of that $10,000 will be taken out of your paycheck automatically. So a little bit each time to go towards social security and Medicare. So your employer withholds it and then they pay it for you on your behalf. Um, it's about seven and a half cents of every dollar is going to these taxes. Um, what you don't see is the payroll tax part for the employer. I remember I mentioned the employer pays on your behalf. Well, they also match that for you. So for you, they pay an additional 750 in social security and Medicare. When you work for yourself, this is where I'm headed, you have to pay both halves. So as an employee of yourself and as an employer, essentially, even though you're technically not an employer, not on payroll, but you get hit with both taxes from both ends. So now what was a seven and a half percent becomes a 15% tax. So you could see really quickly that your tax bill can go up quite a bit on $10,000 in profit or net income or income after expenses. All of these are the same. That's $1,500. There's other things on your tax return. Everyone's tax returns are different. Some people have dependents. Some people are married. Some people are head of household. You know, depending on your situation, you might not end up paying the full 1500 But the fact that that's even the policy is something we need to be mindful of. And that's why I'm constantly trying to encourage people to keep track of their expenses and do record keeping. Because the less taxable income you have, the less taxes you're going to owe. Anyone have questions about this? There's not that many numbers in this workshop. I try to keep it minimal, but I have to do some. This is one of them. So taxes for self-employed people are based on net income, which is income less expenses. So the more expenses you have, the less taxes you're gonna owe. This is my pitch for keep track of everything. Um, is it true that you only have to file taxes as a business if you are only grossing over 15,000 a year? No, no. Basically, if you make $400 after expenses, you technically are going to owe taxes. That's when self-employment tax kits, social security, Medicare tax kicks in. So no, it's, there's no, like, if you only make this, then you don't file taxes. The IRS wants you to pay tax on everything. They want you to claim everything, whether people are do it or not, that's their choice. But as a tax preparer, my job is to tell you, no, there's no minimum. So if you're doing business and you're actively trying to do business, I recognize that some people are like, sometimes I go to this fair and I sell my wares and it's not consistent and I don't consider it like a business. 
I don't think anyone needs to know about that. You know, if, if you're making $10,000, $5,000, you might need to know because you might, and you're using Square Reader. Well, now we have a paper trail. You might want to think about your story, but also that means you can take expenses. So it's not always necessarily now you're going to owe all this money in taxes. So unfortunately, Gabrielle, and no, I wish I could tell you that that was the case. Um, okay. Income and expenses for creatives. I actually forgot to change this to not say creatives. This is my like workshop that I do. And I often do it for a class at PSU. Um, it's like a graduating class. And I try to focus it, my examples for creative. So excuse the language. I'm sure some of you are creatives, um, but it doesn't really matter. It's worth, it's for everyone. Um, so what do we mean by income? Business income comes in many forms, cash, check, credit card, PayPal, Square, Venmo, taxable grants like the RAC grant, which is the Regional, Regional Arts and Culture Council, Prosper Portland grants, um, block grants. If you work with NAIA, the Native American Youth Association, they give out grants, right? These are all taxable. Um, crowdfunding, royalties, gallery sales, Etsy sales, freelance design work, all of it. I mean, what I'm saying is it's all taxable. There's not really a time where it's not considered taxable income. Um, and this is in exchange for your sale of goods or services. Um, sometimes you'll get a form we often call it the 1099. What you'll see nowadays is the 1099 NEC for non-employee compensation. Um, 1099 miscellaneous, 1099K, these are all just tax forms that will say how much someone paid you. So if you're doing service for someone and you do $600 or more a year in, in paid service, um, they will likely issue a tax form. If they don't, you still are supposed to claim it, right? It's on the provide, it's on the pay or to issue it to you, but it is on you to claim it as taxable income. The 1099K is one that we is like for third party. So PayPal, Square, right? Venmo, they're the ones who will issue that. Um, and the 1099 miscellaneous at this point, most commonly you'll see it for like rent. Um, therapists, people that take insurance will see it for like medical payments. It just says a total that this person paid you for the year. Um, the ID matching grant. This one is tough because I have maybe erroneously been really fighting for this not being taxable income. So there's this thing called the individual development account, and it's specific to Oregon, as far as I know, and people get it for houses, people get it for student loan, for uh, student loan or education costs, people get it for a small business. And that's how I encounter it the most. If you're plugged in to the inclusive business resource network, and I have them referenced later, um, they're kind of the hub where you can get in touch with different nonprofits in town that do work um, with small business development. So Hacienda, Nea, ERCO, Mercy Corps, MISO, all these different organizations offer small business support. And one of the programs they have is this IDA program, and it's a matching program where you're in their business foundations program, you're getting support, you're building a plan, and you save money, and then you get it matched three to one. Um, what you save, you actually get a subtraction on your Oregon taxes, which is great. It reduces your taxable income. I've operated on the impression that what you receive in matching is actually a tax-free grant. So that's how I've advised my clients. Another accountant told me, oh, wow, Mercy Corps is five to one. That's amazing. Um, another accountant kind of told me no, but they're also more of a stickler than I <laughs> Am. So I guess moving on, moving on as clients get it, I will probably tell them this is how I've operated and had no issue. Um, but I want you to decide what feels best for your risk tolerance. No one gets tax forms for it. So I don't, I still don't think that it's taxable, but that's my feeling. The IRS has no documentation about it. Oregon, from what I can find, it seems that it's not. And I've been advising people that way for years. So we'll see. Um, and please ask questions if you want to and share information. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so what's not income for self-employed creatives? I didn't put IDA there because I felt like I couldn't say it. I can only talk to you about it because I might be wrong. Um, investing money in your business. So you just putting money into your business is not income. It's, you don't have to call it income. You don't have to claim it. That's just you putting money in. Um, sometimes you call it an owner contribution. Loans received by your business, not income. So that's another thing. Um, these items need to be tracked for cash flow purposes, but they're not taxable income. So they're important to track because you want to know why do you have an additional thousand dollars in your business this year versus other years? Oh, because I put money in to fund it. 
You know, like we need to know if you have debts on the books, we need to know where this money came from and why, and if we owe anyone money and we need to differentiate it from income and expenses, because that's really what tells us how our business is doing. Um, I'm going to keep going unless you stop me, please. Um, so what do we mean by expenses for self-employed creatives and self-employed folks in general? Um, the IRS explains it this way, to be deductible, a business expense must be both ordinary and necessary. It's not supposed to be lavish or extravagant. I don't know what any of these things mean, really. Um, in other words, anything you do that relates to your work, that stimulates or enhances your business, nurtures your professional creativity, improves your skills, wins you recognition, or increases your chances of making a sale is a possible business expense. So June Walker is who I referenced in this. So the first part that's very dry is the IRS. And then June Walker is this incredible resource for independent business owners. Um, tons of free resources, a wonderful um, manual that I have. Um, really accessible and that's how June describes it. So we all as preparers kind of have our own twist on things um, because every business is different. So what's an expense to me may not make sense for someone else's business and, and vice versa. Um, if you wanna rent a portion of your house, um, we can talk about that later because renting is something, a different conversation that doesn't really fall, like rental income in general is not the same as self-employment income actually. And so I don't plan to touch on that today, but Rob Holt, like put a pin in that and like get back to me about that. Or I'll make, I'll take a screenshot of your question. And if I can later, I'll try to talk about it. Um, Cause also renting, renting a portion that's rental income. That's one thing. And then if you are also having a truck and doing driving as a self-employed person, that's separate. Those incomes are different and not taxed the same. So I don't know, maybe that even answers the question. Um, in your situation, I would definitely talk to a tax person about setting this up correctly. Um, that's a great question. Okay, so steps for maximizing expenses. Um, you're self-employed. So once you decide that the relationship that you're having with your customers is actually you're self-employed and you're not an employee, um, anytime you go to spend money, you really want to think about the fact, is this business or is this personal? And it's really about changing a mindset because you're the best advocate for yourself. The IRS is not going to write you and be like, you know, you missed that. You went to office, office depot that day and bought some stuff for work and you didn't put on your taxes. You know, the only time that happens is if you're audited and they go extensively through your receipts and they find something in your favor, you get to still claim it. But that's the only time they're not going to tell you, you know, in your business, it makes sense that you'd have more supplies. You might want to rethink that, you know, not at all. So that's our job is to teach you and to support you in advocating for yourselves. Um, so one of the things I say is defining your business broadly. So rather than, you know, limiting what you do. So I have a client, I always use this as an example because they're kind of a perfect example. They do radio work as a contractor. They've done video production. They teach, um, they, they're in a band. So they do all these kind of creative endeavors that kind of fall under the same set, like lens of there are multimedia artists. So that's kind of the language I use to describe what they do. And on the tax return, on the Schedule C I mentioned earlier, where you put your business income and expenses as a sole prop, single member LLC, um, you have to, they ask that we code like a type of industry you're in because that is not only used for their like tracking purposes, but also that is part of the auditing process because they're like, if you're in this industry and you have these expenses that don't make any sense, you might get flagged. Sometimes people put a code that that's just general 99999. It doesn't mean anything. Like, I don't know how to code it and that's fine. It happens. But if you're a consistently running business, we kind of want you to define what you're doing. Again, I've been doing this for 10 years and haven't had an audit. So the codes I'm using seem to work. I'd use very general ones. Um, but I would like you to define your business broadly, not only for, um, so you only have to register one business name potentially, which is cheaper and easier, but also I don't want you to having five bank accounts. I want you to keep it simple. I want you to keep it easy. I want you to be able to only file one Schedule C for your multimedia artist endeavor instead of five Schedule Cs for the educator, the band, the da, 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 right? Because that's more expensive. That's more time, which means money. Potentially it's more money if you pay someone to do your taxes. If we can keep it simple, if they're relatively close to one another, if you're a plumber and a massage therapist, I would be like, keep those separate. They're very different things. Those expenses don't relate, right? Liability issues, keep them separate. 
Um, work life versus personal life. The only reason I really mention this one is that sometimes it's hard to tell. There's not usually like a well-marked difference between this as business only and this is personal. I mean, I've definitely had many occasion when I was going to see music of like going to a show and it ended up like becoming all about clients. Either I saw clients there or I got clients there. And so I'm like, well, maybe going to this show actually was a business endeavor, you know? And maybe this dinner that I have with my friends, I didn't keep the grocery receipt, but I actually invited over my web developer, who's also my friend, but we talked about my website. So like, how does that work? How do you make it business forward rather than personal forward? And how would you describe that relationship if you were audited? Because none of it actually matters. The story doesn't matter until you're audited. No one's asking on your tax return to explain all your expenses. You just do it. And then if there's a situation that comes up that someone wants more information, then you're going to have to be called to task to explain yourself, to show receipts, et cetera. And we'll keep talking about that. Um, but going into it, the more that you go, is a business, is a personal? And if you have a separate bank account, it really helps. If you don't, if you're not banked and you're using straight up cash, you could do that too. Maybe just have a separate you know, your separate record keeping for personal versus business. It's all about just kind of having that separate hat. And when you're an LLC, in order to protect the liability, do that liability protection we mentioned to keep your personal stuff away from your business stuff, which I'd strongly recommend if you're a homeowner, I'd strongly recommend it if you're in a risky business. So that could be like a contractor, someone who touches people's bodies, someone who touches people's money, like things that could be risky and potential lawsuits. I would definitely have an LLC and especially in Oregon, because it is affordable versus other states, um, you need to have a separation of business and personal on paper to retain the protection. Um, please put questions in there and I'll keep going. Um, so expenses, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about expenses because it's the thing that people want to talk about. It's the thing that makes our income lower, which helps us pay less taxes, which is wonderful. Oh, hold on. For the IDA disbursements, I am to receive a W-9. Yes, interesting. So that's interesting. I have not had someone mention that before. So if you do get a W-9, then chances are that's the form for when you are acting as a contractor. So a W-9, if, if I'm getting paid by somebody, I would give them a, um, they would give me a W-9. I would fill it out with my business name or my name, my tax ID, my address. I would sign it. I give it back to the person who hired me. At the end of the year, they add up how many times, what they've paid me throughout the year. And if it's $600 or more, they are tasked with issuing me a 1099 form. The 1099 is given to me. It's filed with the IRS in Oregon, and it says how much I earned. We talk about 1099s later. It's a whole other thing. But the W-9 often indicates that it might be taxable. So Barbara, that's good to keep it keep in mind for sure. Um, single member LLC is okay. Um, if making less, I mean, single member LLC is okay. Anytime there's no, it not being okay. It's just that at some point there might be a tax benefit to changing and being taxed as an S corp LLC versus a single member. And that will really, at that point, if you're making that much in profit, that for sure at that time, you will wanna to talk to a tax person, right? So I wanna like prevent you from paying too much out of pocket on the front end. And at the point where you're making that money, then it's worth the investment of getting a relationship with somebody and getting some advice. But you can be a single member LLC forever. There's no time where you stop doing it. It's just that I wouldn't advise anyone at a certain level to do it, for example. Um, can I deduct my copay for behavioral health therapy? Um, the only time that uh, mental health would be deductible is for a mental health practitioner. So a massage therapist getting a massage as part of their education is totally legitimate in my mind. So I would encourage clients to write that off for a tax preparer during tax season to get a massage because you're just like this all day. No, that would never fly with the IRS. Would someone claim it? Sure. If they get audited, then they would have to explain themselves. If they don't get audited, then they would be fine. It's 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 uh, audit gambling, basically. <laughs> it's like, what are you comfortable with? I would tell you as a tax preparer, it wouldn't fly, but I wouldn't stop you from doing something that you wanted to do. Um, it's not a great answer. It's not, you know, but it's, it, it's, it's what we are told to teach. Um, so types of expenses. So these are the ones that are pretty standard that would kind of make sense that are not scrutinized as much. And then we talk about the more complicated ones after advertising. So this is like business cards, website, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, right? In the past, maybe pamphlets and things, a sign perhaps. Um, and I should mention the schedule C is not a, it's one sheet of paper and the expenses are like a third of it. 
And that's to cover every kind of sole prop single member LLC, like every type of those businesses, all of our businesses here, millions of businesses around the country all fall into this one sheet and we're expected to plug into like 20 categories. It, it doesn't make sense, right? Every business, it doesn't make sense for everyone to plug into the same ones, but that's what we do so that we can just adhere to what they're asking us for. There is a place to put like other. And what I encourage clients to do is to make an itemized list in that case of subscriptions because subscriptions isn't a category on that form, but it's a totally legitimate one. Some people might call it office supplies. Other people might wanna have a subscriptions category. That's fine. Add it in the line and put the amount paid throughout the year. I wouldn't leave anything in other or miscellaneous. I just feel like that's not enough information to share. Um, so advertising is clear, legal and professional services. It could be a lawyer, it could be a consultant, it could be a bookkeeper, um, fees, bank fees, ATM fees, square fees, PayPal fees, all of these will be deductible. If you have a business bank account, all the fees associated, business credit card, all the fees associated, supplies, that's going to be general consumables, um, office supplies, supplies, cost of goods and equipment all get jumbled with people. So I'm going to do one at a time, but supplies are going to be, um, if you're a contractor, there'll be a hammer. You're not selling a hammer, you're using a hammer to do another thing. It's not usually really expensive. If it's a hammer, that's thousands of dollars. We'll talk about it, but that will be a supply. For me as a tax person, maybe getting a new keyboard or something or a mouse is a supply. It could be office, it could be a general supply. It's whatever works for me and I'm just consistent year over year. Um, subscriptions, like I mentioned, that's not a category on the Schedule C, but I often add it at the end. Um, the Creative Cloud subscription, Dropbox, One Pass, any of these things. Um, uh, I have a virtual office and the rent is withdrawn every month from the business checking. Um, well, actually, I'll talk about that later. I'm going to talk about rent. I'm going to talk about home rent and I'm going to talk about renting a space later. Great questions. You're just ahead of the game. Um, education and research, also not a category. I often add it. Um, that would be continuing ed. And I say this class because if you are paying for this class, yes. Um, workshops, books, etc. cetera. Um, the education to become the thing that you are to then do business is not deductible. So the classes I took to become a tax preparer, not deductible. Everything moving forward, my continuing ed and all the classes I take to enhance what I'm doing, deductible. Okay, so the education to get there, not once you're there, yes. Um, and there's extensive information about education. Um, and I'm actually working currently on making a handbook about all of this, like an extensive handbook that will be free for everyone. I'm doing it with the Native American Youth Association, and I'm hoping I'll have something to share sooner than later. But I want it to be this resource that y'all can access so that it's in the words that make sense, like in my words, rather than lead, reading an IRS publication, which even saying that I'm like, Ugh. so um, I hope to have more information about all these things. But for today, um, insurance, I'm specifically talking about business insurance, liability insurance, malpractice insurance, health insurance is different, um, and we would not claim it here. Um, rent. So paying studio rent. So if it's coming out automatically or you're paying a check, whatever, whatever, I would get your landlord to fill a W-9 out for you. Because technically you're supposed to 1099. This is not for your home office. This is for outside of the home. But technically you should be 1099-ing the people you're paying rent for your studio, practice, office space, retail shop space. With that said, if the person you're paying rent to seems like they're not gonna be cool with that, I would ask them and I would do it via email and have it in written form so that you have your butt covered, but I would not want to jeopardize your ability to do business there. So if, for example, you know, Tara is my landlord for my business and I say, you know, suddenly after all these years, I've never done a 1099, don't worry about it. But now I know, so I'm like, Tara, can you fill out this W-9 so I can issue you a tax form that says how much rent I paid you? And Tara's like, wait, what? No, uh, uh-uh. I don't want to threaten my ability to be in that space because it's really important to me. So I would just keep track I tried and move on. You can still take the rent expense, but just be mindful that the IRS has that expectation of us claiming it. And if you can imagine what it is, it's hot potato of money. They're like, Jenna, if you want to claim a rent expense and lower your taxable income and pay us less, someone better be claiming that income. That's what's going on, right? They want it to bounce and they want it to everyone to be claiming the expense and the income like that. So again, so many of my clients don't do it. So many people don't do it. 
they still do business and they're fine. But the risk is if you get audited and someone asks questions, they could dispute your expense. But that's okay. It's fine. You're not doing anything wrong. None of these are set up for you to succeed. This is so much work. This is so confusing and hard. It should all be free. It should all be easy to do. If you need a tax preparer, it should all be subsidized. It's unbelievable that it's not unbelievable that it's not given our system, but I just want you to know you're not doing it wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> so you do the best within it. Um, taxes and licenses. So the cost to register your business, that $50, that $100 with the Secretary of State, TriMet and City Portal and taxes, those are deductible. Payroll taxes are deductible. Your federal income tax, your state income tax, and your Social Security and Medicare tax are not deductible business expenses. They're personal income taxes. They're based on your business's income, but they're passing through the business and they come to you as a person and you're responsible for them. Um, utilities. So I'm going to talk more about utilities with home office and rent and uh, studio space, but one of the ones I try to support my clients in doing is the business use percent of their personal cell phone and internet. Um, and so I just say what they think is reasonable. I have some people that take 5%, some people that take 90%. It just kind of depends on where they're at with their business and how comfortable they are. I don't ask for their phone records. I let them decide what works for them. But because we live in an age where generally, if you have a cell phone, you probably only have one, then in the past, it was like, if you had a landline, you would have a second one for your business to write it off. This is not where we're at right now. The IRS publications have not updated. So I think it's reasonable to claim a portion of that phone as a business write-off. So cost of goods versus supplies. This is where you can get in the weeds. It's kind of complicated. It only impacts people who are selling things. So if you don't sell stuff and you're just like doing service, if you what you sell is an art print and it's paper and ink, don't worry about this because your cost of goods is negligible. Lots of times people I deal with, bag makers, um, maybe restaurants. Um, I, I've had some clients in the past who own record stores or did record production, you know, so those people have a lot of stuff they're sitting on. Um, if you're never going to sell stuff like me as an accountant, you can just not even listen to this, or you can listen and remember that your friend sells stuff and be like, you might want to think about this. Um, so I just want to say that I realize it's, it's not my favorite part, but I, it's necessary. And I'll explain why, when I tell you the horror story of a client of mine, um, so cost of goods versus supplies. Remember I said supplies can be kind of confusing. Um, so for a bag making company, we're gonna figure out the difference between cost of goods versus supplies. Um, cost of goods are gonna be the things that, you, that are part of the, the final product that is then sold. So if it's a bag making company or a wallet making company, it's the leather, it's the string or the jute, it's the D rings, it's the... Let's see. Yes, that's pretty much on the sheet what those things are. So all the things that end up leaving you, your, your business being sold to your customer, it could be the packaging it's in as well. A mallet, unless you're a mallet seller, a mallet is a supply. You're keeping it. You're using it to make the thing that you then sell. So that's the first thing we need to understand and differentiate. What's the difference between cost of goods and supplies? So we even know what we're talking about. So for those of you who sell stuff, your cost of goods is going to be if you're a vintage resale person and you buy clothes and you resell them, it's the clothes that you're buying and reselling. It's the packaging you put them in to resell them, the labels, et cetera. Um, this is where math is coming in. Apologies in advance, but also it's just what it has to be. How do you calculate this and why does this even matter? So if I have a pottery studio and sell pottery, what would the kiln be? Kiln would be equipment. It's a thing that you use to then make pottery, the clay would be the cost of goods, the glazing stuff, that would be cost of goods. But the kiln itself would generally be equipment. Um, any other like metal tools or things you have to like shape things, that would be like a supply generally. I say the kiln is equipment because it's probably expensive. Um, good question. So say it's your first year of business and you have a bag making business. Um, you start the year off and what the IRS would say, it's your first year you're claiming this on your taxes. So when you start the business off, you have no inventory, you have no nothing. You buy fabric throughout the year for $1,500. You purchase hardware, you purchase packaging for finished goods. At the end of the year, you look around your studio and you add up what's left over, the raw cost, not what you're gonna sell it for, so I'm going to take the finished bags, I'm going to take the parts of bags, the, you know, the wax canvas rolls, and I'm going to add up generally the value of what those are in raw goods. And so in this example, it's $1,700. Time to do some math. So first, you take the starting inventory. 
you add all the purchases throughout the year to get a number. Then you subtract the ending inventory from your beginning inventory plus your purchases to get what your cost of goods sold expense is. So what this means is you only get to expense what you sold. So everything on the floor still that you haven't sold to the IRS is like money. It's why auto dealers have closeout sales. It's why everyone tries to get rid of their inventory in December because they don't want to sit on it. They don't want to sit at the end of the year with more than they started with. If, they, if you are left with more than you started with, then you have to pay tax on that difference. So that's just something to consider. Again, when you're not dealing with millions of dollars in income, you actually don't even have to tell the IRS this. The problem is, is that I don't care. For me, your business at $5,000 is just as important to me as a business that makes $5 million because it's your business. And I want you to keep track of it accordingly because for example, I did have a bag maker that their business scaled up quite a bit and they needed to have this detail in order to um, get a loan. They needed to be able to say how much inventory they had sitting in their studio at the end of the year. They didn't write it all off because they still had it. And so this is complicated. I don't expect you to get it today, but I want you to consider it because for example, I had a bike shop that I was working with and they had a different person do their taxes the first year. So I don't really know what conversation was had, but they started the business in like November in Portland, which you're not doing a lot of bike business in November in Portland. So they didn't buy a lot of stuff. So their first year, they ended with not that much inventory, didn't have much of a tax consequence. January 1, they start the next year with a small amount of inventory. They bought a lot of stuff. And at the end of the year, they had a lot more than they started with. And for them, it was over $10,000 more than they started with, with ended up being $10,000 more in income. And they were not prepared. It happens. It totally happens. And it can be strategic, but they were not prepared. So for them, it was very disempowering because they didn't understand why. And so, you know, we tried to work it a little bit and find ways to kind of lower that number and maybe put some of it as supplies instead, like that they were going to keep in-house to work on bikes or whatever, instead of selling it. You know, we tried to make it better because they couldn't afford to do it. That, that, that wasn't an option. So we, they paid tax for sure. And that problem never happened again, but it was because of a lack of information. And so... The biggest thing I would say is generally, if you're starting and ending with the same amount of stuff, because you only have a closet to store your stuff in, this is not going to really affect you. If you start the year with a thousand dollars of stuff and you end it with around a thousand, it's nothing happened. You sold everything that you did for out, throughout the year. Um, if you end with less, cool. But um, I wouldn't be panicked if you've never done this. I wouldn't feel like you have to change everything. I just want you to consider it. And then canvas, paint, and gesso goods, but paint brushes are supply. Yeah, if the, yes. And for someone, it seems like you're someone who's doing, who's painting canvases. You're not going to have, pro it's probably not like, unless you're doing a lot, a lot, a lot of paintings that you're selling, I wouldn't worry too much about tracking it too intensely. If you're doing five pieces a year that you're selling, you know, I wouldn't worry about it extensively. It's more to me, more high production. Um, but you could definitely keep track of it that way. And that's how I would define it for sure. And then what about wholesale inventory? Um, no. No, you might have a different way that you track your margins. And that's another reason why you want to be mindful of your cost of goods and what it is and what it isn't because of how you charge. And are you charging enough? And how much does it take to make this thing? And how much does it take to make this scone? We want to make sure we're charging enough for it. Um, wholesale inventory, I don't really know. I don't know totally the angle of that question other than it's still cost of goods. You just might not upcharge as much for it. So you might want to track somehow internally how you're handling that. But tax-wise, income, you know, inventory is inventory. Um, and when we track it, we're only doing it at raw value. So it doesn't actually matter for tax purposes. I'm asking you what you bought it for, not what you're going to sell it for. Equipment. So supplies, cost of goods, equipment, these are all kind of things that we get confused about. Equipment, you know, the kiln, like I was saying, these are items. With my clients, I generally, okay, good. I'm glad it helped. I'm generally thinking if it's something that costs $1,000 or more. The IRS has like now said that if you buy something that's less than $2,500, so $2,499, I believe it is, maybe even $2,500, I forget the cutoff, like one item that you can expense it all in the year. There's like a election you put on your tax return. It's called de minimis election. This is all, you know, obviously not words we use. Um, I don't often interact with clients that start businesses and, um, 
have that happening right away. I do have clients that buy large pieces of equipment, um, but I do ask people to track it at $1,000 or more and call it equipment, not just a supply. Part of it is strategic. So when you start a business, the assumption is that you're putting a lot of money out there to start the business. And oftentimes it's gonna be on, sometimes it's gonna be on bigger things, the massage table, the fancy camera, right? A press, depending on if you're a printer, you know, whatever the kiln. And maybe the first year we don't make very much money, but we have these large ticket expenses. What I might want to do strategically is what's called depreciation. And that's when you take something and you take it as an expense, but over several years. So instead of taking this $3,000 piece of equipment in year one, when we didn't really make any money, what if we spread it out over for equipment? It's about seven years is usually the standard. What if we spread it out over seven years and then in years where we're making more money, we're still getting to deduct that portion of it. So it's really about strategy. And again, it doesn't often affect a ton of people. I mean, service based businesses don't have a ton of equipment. Usually it's like a computer a massage table, you know, maybe a couch for a therapist. Like there's it, it's not necessarily something that I interact with a ton. I do have people that have business vehicles. I do have people with printing equipment. I do have people that have um, kitchen equipment. Um, but it's about imparting strategy um, to how we write things off and the IRS has rules around it. So what I would just say is maybe just think of it a little bit differently when you categorize it. Uh, local meals. So meals are a big question for people because it's confusing and what can I write off and what can I or write off as an expense, interchangeable. Um, I differentiate between local meals and travel meals. So local meals are gonna be in town travel is going to be, it's an overnight. And I talk about that in the next slide. A local meal, you can't be alone. So me deciding to go to a cafe and eat lunch and do work would not be a justifiable business expense if the IRS were to audit me. But if I go with um, my business partner and we eat some food together, it's for business purposes, we keep the receipt and then we uh, call it uh, meals expense. I tell my clients to track local and travel separately. Um, same thing, coffee shop for a writer, same thing. Unless you are having a meeting with someone, you have to be present with somebody else. One might ask the question, how does anyone know if anyone else is there? But the IRS says you have to be with somebody else. So whether or not you just pay for yourself and get a single receipt and they get theirs, but technically it's, you, it's not about you working in a place and having coffee because you work well at the coffee shop. That would not that would not fly based on IRS publication. Um, for 2021 and 2022, meals at an established and they're kind of specific. They're like it's not just getting groceries. It's like an actual like place that regularly serves meals, whether it's takeout or it's in in house seating. Um, you can write off 100% of that expense, much like every other expense, right? We say the whole thing is deductible. Some of them we take a longer period of time, but generally things, you buy a thing, you expense it. Every other year, it's only been 50% of the cost of the meal. So when you do your taxes and you plug in the numbers into the software, they're going to cut the whole meals in half to 50%. And that's what you get to take as an expense. So for 2021 and 2022, the argument was like, due to how hard it's been for the food service to deal with the pandemic, um, it was supposed to be like an impetus to get people to be encouraged to, be, it's okay to buy food because you can write the whole thing off as opposed to in the past where you couldn't. So I don't know, but it is a nice um, thing to know moving forward if you have spent some money on meals for business. Um, travel. So I don't know how applicable this will be right now, but we're gonna talk about it anyway, because it does matter. Um, I'm gonna be selling at the Oregon Convention Center and staying at a hotel. Um, do you live in Oregon or in Portland, or are you just staying there because it's gonna be easier? You can write a little bit more. Um, I mean, generally, like I'm gonna talk about travel right now. So if you're doing an overnight, the assumption usually is it's away from your home, but there might be a situation where maybe you're staying there because it's easier to deal with your stuff when you're across the street. Um, I think that would be a tough one to call travel if you're local. I live in Hillsborough, I'll stay at a hotel for five nights. You know, 
it's hard to get to Hillsborough. The traffic's gnarly. So yes, I feel like that would be a reasonable thing for me. Um, I have never had a client ask me that before. So I don't think it's a thing that happens often. So I wouldn't encourage people to like stay in town at a hotel to buy food to write off, even though that wouldn't make sense anyway, because it would cost more than it'd be worth. But yes, I think if you're staying there to do the convention center thing, and then you, um, I would say that's a really tough one. Um, I think it's far enough away. And since you're spending the overnight, I would say the food should be deductible because you're not home. So I think that would be reasonable. Um, I think that's a really great question and why taxes are really hard and why we can't give blanket answers for everyone's situation because you might have a situation that's a bit of like a, a teaser. Um, and again, it, it doesn't matter really what I think. What happens is you do your, you decide for your taxes what you're gonna claim and it's really if you get audited, right? The big if, um, but that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, so travel, that would be airfare, lodging, rental car, bus, train, cab, convention fees, um, and meals. And this, you know, hints on what Barbara's saying, like, do I have to be with somebody to write off the meal when you're traveling for business, which is assumed to be an overnight? No, all the food will be deductible. So that's something to consider. Um, that doesn't, you know, the whole, my whole thing is that I try to get people that are already spending this money to figure out how to make it business forward, right? So if you have family in San Francisco and you tend to go to San Francisco every year to see your family, is there a way that that can become a business trip? Like, can you teach a class? Can you take a class? Can you get clients while you're down there? So if you can turn it into a business forward thing where you also then stay with your family, to me, that would be something I would take as, a, as an uh, expense. Um, so it's not about doing it just to write it off. It's about taking the things we already do and turning it into a write-off if possible, um, within the confines of the law. Um, so what about travel? If it's mixed use business and personal, you know, what this taxes for artists is an Instagram handle that I follow. They're really knowledgeable and informative and wonderful. And I have their reference in here and what they say about it. Cause it's actually kind of hard to figure it out based on the IRS information. Um, if the trip is more than 50% personal, then the travel expenses are not deductible. So that means like the lodging and the travel back and forth, but if the, in, but individual business expenses are. So if you go to Chicago for five days for personal reasons, but then you go talk to a client or you meet a possible client, one of those days, then the travel to and from that client, maybe the meal would be deductible according to the IRS, but not the travel for the trip because you were there for five days for pleasure or four days for pleasure, one day for work. Um, if a trip is more than 50% business, then deduct the business portion of your total travel. So then we would do a, a, a portioning. Um, so if it's, you go on that same trip and actually three days were business and two days were personal, you would take that portion, whatever percentage that works out, three fifths of the travel and lodging as a business expense. Again, nobody knows. But this is what you have to consider. This is what the IRS would say, and this is how I would prepare you for an audit. Um, if you if you go abroad and your trip is seventy five percent or more business, then the whole trip should be deductible. So, but traveling abroad that's a tough one to write off. So you really should do some research before you can justify that expense. Um, studio and office people asked about this earlier. So if you rent a studio outside of the home, it could be a shop space at a tattoo shop. It could be an art studio. It could be you're in a band and you have a practice space. It could be a contractor stores there material somewhere. It could be a retail space. All of the expenses will be a write-off rent, utilities, repairs, cleaning, insurance, decor, all of it will be a business expense. If you work from home, well then similarly, portions of your expenses might be deductible. And I use the example of like a studio apartment to just show that I know that there's like this idea that you have to have a room with a door and that room is only ever business. And that's how it is. And that's the only way you can write off a home office. And again, this is completely problematic and incredibly classist and incredibly tone deaf because the majority of people do not live in a space where they can shut a door, where there's even a door to shut. And so that doesn't mean they're not working from home and using their resources for work. So how do we kind of bend to make that work and make that argument? Because IRS law changes because people fight. 
just like most things, right? Is like people make a court case and people fight back. And so to me, I would feel comfortable with a studio apartment situation for a client saying, well, how much square footage of this space is just office? And maybe they also have a closet where they store all their office supplies or their fabrics or whatever. So maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10%, whatever that is, that square footage, that's how we determine how much of your rent and utilities and other costs to live there are potentially tax deductible. So it's just percentages. Again, similarly like to travel, your utilities, like how do we take something that you're paying for out of pocket and turn it into even a portion of it a business expense? Because it still means what happens is that you lower your taxable income by that portion and now we pay less tax. So um, I think that's a really good example. You can have both. You can work from home and have a studio outside the home. It's really important though to determine which one's the main place of business and be really consistent about that and clear about that. Um, I think home offices are very justifiable right now. <laughs> I don't think anybody would argue with anybody having a home office at this point. So something to keep in mind. Um, auto expense, this is the other one, kind of mathy. Um, so first, first of all, if you don't own the vehicle, so if you're not a co-owner or the owner of the vehicle, then this is not applying to you. You can write off auto stuff, but it'd be more like travel, like a lift, you know, renting a vehicle, it would be gas costs and things like this is specifically when we talk about the auto worksheet on the tax return, it's your vehicle or a vehicle you kind of collectively own. Um, there's two ways to do it. There's either the mileage track or the actual expense track. Actual expense is saying like writing off the value of the vehicle and like the, all the costs you incur, gas, insurance, repairs, blah, 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 based on how much you use it for business. Mileage is simple. How many miles do you use it for business? You multiply that by some kind of standard rate that's set every year. And then voila, we got your deduction. 90% of my clients do this, probably more than 90% do this. Easy breezy. Um, what we want you to do and encourage you to do is track your miles. So one of the ways you could do it is like, see what the odometer is at the end of this year. Then we have a starting for January. And then we see what it is at the end of the year. That's our total miles for the year. And then keep track for sure of your business ones. The way I do it is I have a calendar and I write down where I go. And then every few months or something, I'll do a little Google mapping of my places. I don't, especially now I'm not traveling that much for work, but I don't other than tax season, I don't do much work travel. Um, if you do a lot of that, then you might wanna get something like the Mile IQ app or some other app that will help you track it. Some people do a notebook in the car. Some people have a really consistent schedule. Some people go to the same client for a month and then they stop and they go to someone else. It's so whatever system works for you. And I talk about tools later as well. Um, the mileage claim, no, rental car is totally different. If you were doing a rental car, you would just do the costs of the rental car if it's for business. If you're doing business and personal with the rental car, then again, we're gonna do a percentage. But auto expenses and this particular worksheet is only talking about a car that you own. If it's not a car you own, you're going to put it on a separate place. And it's the Schedule C in the travel section. Um, if you're traveling to and from your workspace, is that included? So commuting, great question. No, commuting miles are not deductible. So if your main place of business is your retail space and you go there every day, back and forth, commutes are never considered deductible to anyone. But the trip that you have to go get supplies from there, the second location you go to, those would be. So it's, I mean, it's complicated, but that that that's how the IRS says it. That's what I'm gonna tell you. You do what you can with that information and know what they consider deductible and what isn't. I've had clients be like, well, that doesn't work for me. I'm a florist and I have to go to my, my shop and I have to get the, the flowers and I can't hire someone to do that. And I have to, you know, my, that's the only way I can afford to do this. And they were like, I'm going to write off those miles to and from, because I have to bring the flowers from my house. And I was like, I think that's reasonable. If they get audited, they might have to explain it. And maybe what happens? Well, maybe they say, you know what? You can't take that mile as deduction. You have to pay tax on it. That's what's going to happen. Unless you have gross negligence on your taxes, where you're like not claiming this $30,000 that you earned that you got a 1099 for, and you didn't put it on your taxes, like not claiming a hundred, you know, claiming an extra hundred dollars in expenses because of mileage and not understanding what would happen probably is that you would explain it to the auditor. And I'm guessing they would say, well, you have to pay tax on that hundred dollars. It's not like now you owe $5,000. You know, so it's all relative to your situation and the money numbers we're talking about and you getting comfortable advocating for yourself. So I say, do your best. I'm going to tell you how I navigate it with clients, but I empower you to do what feels best to you. 
Um, so if you're doing the mileage deduction, we figure out those business miles, we multiply them by the rate, we're good to go. The rate you can just find online, standard mileage rate, it's gonna change every year. Um, it's 50 something cents a mile, it's significant. Um, commuting miles not deductible, unfortunately, if your primary place of business is your home office, so mine is, whenever I do business outside of my home, to and from, deduction. So that's a difference, right? If your primary place of business where you do most of your admin, your work, et cetera, that's your primary place of business. If you have two locations, your home office won't be your primary if you don't do 75% of more of your work there. Again, who decides that? I don't know. You have to keep track of it and decide for yourself what makes sense because you might be someone who has an office, but you do all your admin scheduling, bookkeeping, all these things. And maybe a lot of that is done at home and maybe more time is spent at home than not. And I just want you to have that story straight, knowing what the IRS would say. Actual expenses, we still have to track our miles. We figure out how much we use the vehicle for business versus personal. That percentage becomes what we use to then multiply by our value of our car, our insurance, our this, our that. So really, if your car is a gas guzzler, this might work for you and you mostly use it for business, this might work for you. If your car is really fuel efficient, mileage is probably the way to go, probably. Um, the people that I have that do actual are like a business that does boilers and stuff and they have vans, right? I have someone who has a business and they have a van that's like very old and costs a million dollars to run. And that's like, they write the whole thing off because it's really expensive. The majority of everyone else doesn't do that. For those clients I have that have vehicles, regardless of the age of the vehicle, most of them are mixing business and personal. I do mileage myself. I think it's really easy and it's a really great deduction. I just don't want you to miss it. You know, I think it's, it, some things are easily missed because people get overwhelmed by the tracking, but really if you're working really hard to get your business off the ground and make that dollar, why pay tax on it if you don't have to? You know, like why, why? <laughs> There's no reason for it. Um, record keeping. So, oh, it's already 7.15. Okay. I'm going to try to get through this. We're doing great. Um, but some of this stuff, um, we've already talked about, and also you'll have access to this. This was like the, the, the big part of it. We just went through, um, like I said, keep your receipts and you can read about this. I say seven years. I say digital or paper. I say have a folder in your email account that you label every year, 2021 tax year receipts, 2022, have some place where you put all that information in. Um, I say keep as many as you can. Do I keep all mine? Absolutely not. Do I claim the expenses? Totally. Do your best. Things that are kind of weird meals. Is it business? Is it personal? You know, travel. Keep those things for sure because those are the ones that are more audited than like an accountant buying a tax guide. You know, <laughs> like it's not, they're no one's going to argue that. Um, open a business bank account. So even if you're a sole proprietor and it's just your name and social, get a separate checking account. Most credit unions are going to do that for free. And that way you can have a differentiation between business and personal, and it's going to help you keep track. Um, use a calendar. I use a calendar for everything. And that helps me with my mileage claim. It helps me having materials in case I get audited to explain my um, expenses and tools. Mile IQ app for miles. Wave app is like my new favorite hero of the year. It is free. It is bookkeeping. It works really well for most businesses, especially starting off. If you're a heavy PayPal user, it's not going to work for you because it does not connect to PayPal. It's uh, business. Uh, it's mostly checking accounts, savings accounts, um, credit card accounts, et cetera, but it doesn't work with PayPal. PayPal is kind of a pain. So um, that's the only bummer, but it's free. QuickBooks Online, the one I like is the Simple Start. It's like about $25 a month. It's still a great tool and I've been referring people to it for years. Um, spreadsheet, totally fine. I have one in here and I have a resource to it. Um, I would just say some kind of tool. If you're a paper and pen kind of person, also wonderful, just be consistent. The more advanced you have with tools, the easier it's gonna to be to generate reports, which more than ever we know we need to get unemployment with the pandemic, to get small business administrative funding. Everybody needed reports and those people who were prepared, it was easier for them to access it sooner. So that's another reason why you wanna be your best advocate. Um, so spreadsheet for tracking income and expenses. This is just a page from it. It probably looks wild on your screen. I have the link to get to it. It's on my website as well. I don't know if that link will be great for it, but on my website, you can download it. Um, Mercy Corps made it and then I adapted it. I was working with their small business program. And what you wanna know is that every single sheet is a month of the year. 
And then the last sheet is actually an income and expense statement for every single month. And then there's a cumulative one for the year and it has all the equations built in. So if you can fill this out, you would put the date of the transaction. So say it's January, 2022, you would put the date, you'd put a description, whatever you wanna put. If it's money in, it goes in the income column. If it's money out, it goes in any one of these blue columns based on category. And then I left a kind of open one that if you wanted to label it, what you wanted to label it, it's unlocked so you can have your own. If you're not savvy with spreadsheets, don't worry about it. This has just been a tool that my tech averse clients have liked using and it gets you ready to then use software because you'll get tired of doing this and then you'll go, I need something else. Um, profit and loss. So this is what it ends up generating for you. It'll generate your income, your cost of goods and all your expenses and then give you what you have at the end. And that's how we figure out your taxes. That bottom line, that's how we determine your taxes. And so with my clients right now, I'm looking at these numbers and I'm saying, based on this, this is what I think you're gonna owe this year. So let's prepare. We still have a couple of months left. Rather than it being February and you're like, oh my God, I owe and April's around the corner. We can actually prepare. There's no surprises with taxes with my clients if they want to do this for themselves. Um, for short term, it tracks your profit margins. So you can tell if you're charging the right amount. It tells you when you have slow times. It tells you how to run your business differently. And for long term, it helps with tax planning, retirement savings, um, et cetera. This is an example of the Schedule C where it shows you all the income and expense categories. So there's 27 categories. That's not very much. Well, actually, no, that's just, no, it's like 20, it's 19 expense categories because the other ones are income and cost of goods. So there's not much here for general businesses. Um, so this is just where you plug in the numbers, right? So we do all the work on the back end. We know what expenses and income are. We have a way to keep track and then we dump them into the schedule C and that's how we prepare our business income and expense return. Um, loose ends. So I'm not going to go into this because I could talk about this for hours, but this is how to issue a 1099. Um, but I have information on my website about it. You could do it yourself. You could do it on paper. You could do it electronic. Um, but just be familiar with the process. If you're paying someone rent for your business outside of your home, not home office, if you are paying people for their labor and they're not your employee, so they're a contractor of some kind, you want to be mindful that if you pay them $600 or more in the year, you should be issuing them a 1099 according to the IRS. So it's about relationship. Talk to people that you're working with and hiring and say, is it cool if I give you this form? Are you prepared for that? Can you fill out this W-9, give it back to me, and I might issue a tax form. Um, filing taxes versus paying taxes, something just so you should know, filing and paying, not the same thing. Taxes are filed by April 15th, right? Your personal 1040, where the Schedule C goes, is due April 15th, 2022, unless it gets delayed again. This example doesn't work because they keep changing the date. It's like a moving target. Um, April 15th, 2022, 2021 taxes are supposed to be filed. The money is really actually due though throughout the year. You're supposed to be paying all the time, right? Quarterly, whenever, you know, you're supposed to, they expect if you're going to owe a thousand dollars or more, they want to see that money throughout the year. Your employer's doing it when you have an employer, you need to be doing it for yourself. If you don't, it's totally fine. There just might be a little bit of a penalty involved, but oftentimes it's not that big of a deal compared to like, if you had to borrow that money from someone else or use a credit card or whatever, the IRS in terms of like, a debt collector is very reasonable. Oregon Department of Revenue, not as nice, but the IRS is really um, open to working with the taxpayer, as long as you're not running from them. If you're accessible, if you talk to them, if you work out a plan, it's totally fine. So I just wanna make sure you understand that you can file an extension for your personal taxes. So you can file them six months later, that would be October. That's what people just did, but it doesn't extend the time to pay. The money was still due April. So, the penalties start accruing in April, even if you file an extension. So that's how I just want you to understand there are different things that have different penalties associated. And actually the penalty that you don't file on time, if you didn't do an extension is significantly greater than the payment penalty, which tells me they care more about you filing and staying on top of the filing than they do about the paying. So something to be mindful of, if you haven't filed in a long time and you're worried about it, there's people that can help you with that. And we want to work with you. Um, just not during tax season, talk to someone outside of tax season about back taxes, but I've helped people file 10 years before and it, and it worked out. It was scary. Some people owed a bit, but they set up a plan and think just getting over the hump of doing it gave them so much relief because then they just had a plan to work on it because a lot of people carry debt. They don't think of that same way. Student loans, homes, 
other kinds of medical debt, like people have a sense of the IRS that's like different and it's, and it's actually, they're really negotiable. Um, quarterly tax payment schedule and ways to pay. Again, I'm sorry, I'm rushing, but we're almost out of, out of time. Um, and hold on, my computer for some reason is not plugging in. Um, there we go. Uh, okay. Um, the quarterly schedule, this I put in for the 2021 tax year, um, when quarterly payments are due um, and the ways that you pay the federal and state. Clearly, I haven't shown you how to figure it out, but what I will tell you is that generally, if you're tracking your money in and money out, your income and expenses specifically, and then we have that bottom line number, like I showed you with the profit and loss from the spreadsheet, whatever the bottom is, that net income, I would say save 30% of that. That should cover federal, state, and local taxes, and maybe even then some. So that would be like my rule of thumb for people if they wanna save. Um, if you're not keeping track of your money in and out and you don't know that net income number, then maybe save like, if you're a retail person with lots of expenses, maybe save like 15%. If you're a service-based business, maybe save like 25. If you don't have a lot of expenses, your income and you know income after expenses will probably be pretty similar. Um, local taxes for small business, TriMet tax. I just show you the, the amount it is. It's basically, if you have that $10,000 profit, it's this weird decimal thing and it's $73. That's pretty much it. Um, and city of Portland tax, um, they just changed it. And it, the minimum was $200. And it was only if you made $50,000 or more before expenses. So gross income, you would have to pay $200. Now they've actually changed it. And it's a hundred dollars if it's if it's fifty thousand above fifty thousand but below a hundred it's a hundred dollars if it's a hundred or more then it goes up to two hundred and then some it's not a very high tax relative to the other ones we've talked about but it's something that you have to keep track of um, they also love sending nasty letters they love sending letters that say you owe us a presumptive tax if you ever get a letter from the city that's threatening or says presumptive it doesn't mean they're right it oftentimes means they're wrong call them and try to work it out. If you make less than $50,000 before expenses, so your business makes $1,000, you're not gonna owe them any money. They want you to file and register with them and just say, I get an exemption, I, I, I didn't make enough. They ask us to send them pieces of the tax return to prove it, but you're never gonna owe them a late fee or anything because you never owed in the first place. It's the same thing with the IRS. If you don't owe tax, if you're getting a refund, they're not gonna penalize you for not filing because they don't care, they're not gonna pay you. <laughs> So, you know, if you're late and you owe, that's where we start to have issues. Um, personal property taxes. This is just, I put this in so that I was being a responsible tax person. But again, unless you have $17,000 worth of like equipment, you probably do not even have to worry about this ever. I've never filed it, like I said, so maybe now I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, but I put the information there and how to get more access to it. Um, and penalties and interest. So this just explains what they are and how to calculate them. And again, the most penalty is for failure to file your taxes. Um, you know what, I think I have to fix, yes, I have to fix the slide because some of the, the failure to file part is wrong. It's actually a 20% tax, not a 5%. So I'll fix the slide before Tara shares it. Um, what happens if you get a letter about your taxes? Don't hide it, don't rip it up, don't send the money open it, read it, call the number, ask for help. Do not think it's going to go away because it's not. Um, I've seen it all. It's happened to me. I've had my bank account frozen before, before I learned how to do taxes. It was an error. It's part of what inspired me to do taxes because I thought, wow, if I didn't have my community and resources and privilege, I would not have a home anymore. So I thought, wow, that is so real and so unfair like so many things are and if i can help people understand how to advocate for themselves and never have that happen to someone that's what i want to do so part of that is you got to look at it you got to share it with someone and they not, may not be able to help you the first time but we can always call the irs and just say please give me a minute like please help me figure this out it's not in their best interest to not help you figure out how to pay so, you know, and I say the IRS is an example, but Oregon honestly is more aggressive than the IRS. So if you can pay Oregon, take care of them. Um, and then here's some of the free and local low cost services for small businesses that I've talked about. There's tons, there's so many resources out there. Um, thank you so much for coming. I just made it. <laughs> 
two minutes to go.